Hi there. Um, it's almost, it's 12.10 now. We'll give another minute or so for people to filter in. Um, but I want to just first welcome you uh, to the uh, resumption of in-person readings for Lunch Bumps, which we're really so thrilled about. Um, my name is Noah Warren. I'm going to be directing the Lunch Bumps series this year. Um, and I want to first I also just thank everyone who's been showing up these past two years on Zoom, um, kept this community kind of vibrant and bringing really some remarkable poetry to Berkeley. Um, that said, it is to be back in Morrison, um, such a privilege, such a delight, um, and to be able to experience the kind of energy that poetry can fill a room with, I think is, uh, it's been something that's been sorely missed. So we'll take, all right, looks like we got the door closing. Um, so yeah, welcome and thank you all. It's my, uh, before we get started, please silence your phones. Um, we'll read, Alex will read for about half an hour after the introduction. Unfortunately, uh, our friends at Moe's could not make it today. So uh, if you are engaged, make sure to seek out Alex's books on your own time. They're really worth the time. Um, all right, who is Alex Dimitrov? There's a perverse logic in contemporary American poetry uh, that suggests it's sometimes deleterious for poets to morph and change uh, as they write their way into the future. This is said to detract uh, from the affirmation, uh, all important, of developing an instantly recognizable style. The result is a landscape that sometimes looks strewn with promising beginnings that have turned stale um, as people reiterate the discoveries they made at 25. In counterpoint, I present Alex Dimitrov. Uh, style he clearly has, just look at him. And he's developed a voice on the page that's vivid and pressing uh, like none other, uh, of no other poet writing today. And I'm here to marvel just for a second um, at the mastery that underlies that style and that presence and to also just remark at how many voices uh, he's explored in the 10 years he's been writing. His resting stance, I think, is a semi-social, semi-lyric, uh, around 25 lines, that emerges in the penumbra of intimacy, going or leaving on an app or addressed to someone who may just be someone. 2017's book, Together and By Ourselves, pushed this mode a little longer and more sinister to poems that kept moving till they found their haunting ends in the curdle of Tom Moore. Love and Other Poems, his most recent book, um, metabolizes Frank O'Hara, who's been there all along in Dimitrov's poetry. Um, it's become, the style has become breezier, intensely charismatic, uh, and at once more impersonal and more vulnerable. Recently, he stood on what Sounds like, if I dare say it, uh, a wisdom literature, albeit a very sexy one. We'll see. Um, much is said about tenderness, vulnerability, and pain these days in poetry. These are demanded on the surface. Dimitrov's poems serve precisely the opposite. They're cool, they're polished, they're brisk motion through the world and through people takes on pathos as we begin to sense beneath these qualities what they defend against, need, sorrow. But lightly, even as the poems affecting blasé sometimes sigh about parties or men, they as often pivot in the next moment to celebrate these rituals. They look levelly at the continuance of change and they celebrate parties and men. Um, and of course, New York. I love, finally, how Dimitrov has broken down the boundaries between the poem, life, and the mediation of these two on the internet. Calling to us, the listener or the reader, directly, hello, or look at the sky, kiss anyone you can for sure. He asks us to double our lived experience and our pleasure with our experience of the poem. He writes from a cab, many cabs, and makes sure we know how real those journeys are, even as they become a metaphysical state. And in the title poem of Love and Other Poems, the anaphora, I love, 
spills boundlessly beyond the page and is continued onto the internet day by day um, as it praises and mourns the world. I'm delighted to welcome to Berkeley into this space one of the best and most interesting poets writing today, Alex Dimitrov. That was the most considered introduction I've ever gotten, Noah. You should read the poems for me, actually. Who is Alex Dimitrov? Um, I'm really happy to be here. I've never um, been to Berkeley, um, and it's a beautiful campus, though I walked for about three minutes. I was really hot. Clearly, I'm wearing the wrong attire. I always am. Um, but. Thank you for coming. I didn't know who would come. Uh, Noah told me that this was the first event after two years or something like that. So uh, this is also the earliest I've ever read poems. I usually wake up around this time. So <laughs> let's see how this goes. <clears throat> Sunset on 14th Street. I don't want to sound unreasonable, but I need to be in love immediately. I can't watch this sunset on 14th Street by myself. Everyone is walking fast right after therapy, texting back their lovers, orange hearts, and unicorns. It's insane to me. They're missing this free sunset willingly. Or even worse, they're going home to cook and read this sad poem online. Let me tell you something. People have quit smoking. They don't get drinks, but they juice. There are way too many photos, and most all of us look better in them than we do in life. What happened? This is truly so embarrassing. I want to make a case for 1,440 minutes every day where we stop whatever else is going on and look each other in the eyes like dogs, like morning newspapers and evening light. So long, so much for this short drama. We will die one day and our cheap headlines won't apply to anything. The internet will be forgotten, all the praise and pandering. I'd really rather take a hike, and by the way, I'm gay. The sunset too is homosexual. At least today, between the buildings, which are moody, and the trees, which honestly, they look a bit unhealthy here. They're anxious. They're concerned. They're wondering why I'm broke and lonely in Manhattan, though of course I'll never say it. And besides, it's almost spring. It's fine. It's goth. Hello. The truth is, no one will remember us. We're only specks of dust, or one, one speck of dust, some brutes who screamed for everything to look at us, well, look at us, still terrible and awful, awful and pretending we're not terrible, such righteous saints, repeating easy lines, performing our great politics, it's just so very boring. The real mystery, in fact, is how we manage to make room for love at all. Punk rock, avant-garde cinema, I love you, reader, but you should know the sunset's over now. I'm standing right in front of Nowhere Bar, dehydrated and quite scared, but absolutely willing to keep going. It makes sense you do the same. It's far too late for crying and quite useless too. You can be sad and still look so good. You can say New York is beautiful and it wouldn't be a headline and it wouldn't be a lie. Just take a cab and not the six. It's never once in 10 years been on time. It's orbiting some other world where there are sunsets every hour and no money and no us. That's luck. The way to get there clearly wasn't written down. Don't let that stop you, though. Look at the sky. Kiss everyone you can, for sure. Uh, someone said this book was optimistic when it came out, and I thought that was uh, a very kind of post-COVID reaction to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, though, you know? Um, I'm, I'm happy if people feel good reading these poems. In fact, I kind of wanted to design them for the first time so people would perhaps feel good instead of bad. I mean, I wrote two books before that where I was just thinking of no one but myself, so. And I was not feeling good. You know what's really funny? I was broke when I wrote this book, quite literally. And um, I didn't have healthcare for two years because I was adjuncting. And um, I was happier than I've ever been. Isn't that weird? I don't want to glamorize it or anything. But um, you know, now that I have healthcare, I'm like, oh, do I really want to be here? I'm just kidding. This is not, <laughs> this is not going to turn into one of those readings. Um, Noah mentioned Frank O'Hara, who is, of course, a ghost in this book, a ghost in kind of my life in New York. Um, someone before the reading came up to me and mentioned John Ashbery. People who are very important to me, the New York School is very important to me. And so when I wrote this poem originally, I, um, this next poem, 
I thought, you know, well, you could just make fun of yourself, you know, with the title. And it's called Having a Diet Coke with You, um, obviously after the Frank poem. Um, and also when, when, when the book came out, I got in trouble because someone said, like, why not a regular Coke? Why a Diet Coke? I think someone called me a body Nazi. And I was like, sweetie, I am not drinking a regular Coke. I do not care what the politics are. There is no way. Having a Diet Coke with you. Having a Diet Coke with you is even better than a regular Coke because in New York, the streets are so skinny. I'm always worried about my hair, walking down Lex in the morning, or if we'll ever get universal health care, and I can be assured I'm dying in all the regular ways. Nothing unusual, by a professional who touches me lightly on the chest. The first time I've been touched in months, so I consider falling in love after. Oh God, Alex, what's wrong with you? I can't believe this is the title of your poem. If you look up, the billboards are sexy and American, letting you forget all the cruel things you've said to your boyfriends. There are other things I need you to remember, like please stop taking cabs so you won't have to take out a loan or become a lawyer. And please stop having sex with men who are terrified of looking at your face when you cry. One day your choices will be limited and you'll wear the same outfit into the beyond, into the gold sea. I'm going to bury you in a white suit infinitely delicate and infinitely expensive, as Plath wrote, as you are, as you've been even on bad days. This is the love poem no one gave you, and thank God, they couldn't do it like this. Not only will we drink Diet Coke in this poem, I'm also taking us to Barney's so you can flirt with the tall boy selling sneakers and talking very slowly about his gentle sword tattoo. People of the world, don't stop. Don't give up style, irony, or Manhattans. Don't apologize for wanting to fuck someone new because you need to feel alive. I get it. I've been there. I'm imagining you reading this with a phone in your hand, in your room, by a desk, on a train, or a platform. Don't wait to do what you want. This is what I've wanted to say from the first line. Don't wait, because people don't have the answer. I've written this ending before in a book called American Boys, but I'll write it again for anyone who wasn't paying attention or talking shit about me on the internet. I'll never get over the fact that the buildings all light up at night, and the night comes every night, and without regret, we let it go. We sleep a little and we live. That's what we do. I uh, always write down what I'm gonna read because um, if I don't, I like to jump around and then just read poems. I had, you know, it's so funny. Someone asked me, uh, a student asked me the other day, because school has started again, um, how do you order a book? Which is a really hard question because it's really, there's no right answer. It's just style, right? However you want to. Um, I had one guiding principle for this book is that just don't write any bad poems. So then when you're <laughs> so then when you're here sort of reading anywhere, you can just flip to whatever and read it. Um, I don't know if I succeeded, but I'll tell you, I'm, I feel easier flipping through this one than the last one. The last one really gave me anxiety. Um, and this one's just sort of, um, wow, I was really in a good mood when I wrote it. Um, can you believe? June. There will never be more of summer than there is now. Walking alone through Union Square, I am carrying flowers and the first rosé to a party where I'm expected. It's Sunday and the trains run on time, but today death feels so far it's impossible to go underground. I would like to say something to everyone I see, an entire city, but I'm unsure what it is yet. Each time I leave my apartment, there's at least one person crying, reading, or shouting after a stranger anywhere along my commute. It's possible to be happy alone. I say out loud and to no one, so it's obvious. And now here in the middle of this poem. Rarely have I felt more charmed than on 9th Street, watching a woman stop in the middle of the sidewalk to pull up her hair like it's an emergency. And it is. People do know they're alive. They hardly know what to do with themselves. I almost want to invite her with me, but I've passed, and yes, it'd be crazy, like trying to be a poet, trying to be anyone here. How do you continue to love New York? My friend who left for California asked me. It's awful in the summer and winter and spring and fall last maybe two weeks. This is true. It's all true, of course, like my preference for difficult men, which I had until recently, because at last, for one summer, the only difficulty I'm willing to imagine is walking through this first humid day with my hands full, not at all peaceful, but entirely possible and real. The friend in that poem is Morgan Parker. She was moving to Los Angeles when I was writing this book, and she was really trying to take me with her. Not hard, you know. It's uh, she's a she's a good friend to move with, but um, 
And I was like, I don't know if I want to do movies yet. <laughs> I don't know. You know, LA seems fun, but not yet, not yet. It's been like two decades like that in New York. Not yet. Um, July. I promise you I know we're in September, but. At last it's impossible to think of anything as I swim through the heat on Broadway and disappear on the Strand. Nobody on these shelves knows who I am, but I feel so seen. It's easy to be aimless, not having written a line for weeks. Outside New York continues to be New York. I was half expecting it to be LA, but no luck. No luck with the guy I'm seeing, no luck with money, no luck with becoming a saint. I do not want you perfect life. I decided to stay a poet long ago. I know what I'm in for. And still, the free space of the sky lures me back out. Not even canonical beauty can keep me inside. And beauty, I'm done with you too. I guess, after all, I'll take love. Sweeping, all-consuming, grandiose love. Don't just call or ask to go to a movie. That's off my list too. I want absolutely everything on this Friday afternoon when not one person is looking for me. I'm crazy and lonely. I've never been boring. And believe it or not, I'm all I want. Should be my Tinder profile, right? That poem. <laughs> you know, I, I'm done with Tinder, talking about things I'm done with. Now I'm on Raya, woo. <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, this is another poem that's riffing on Frank O'Hara. Um, hmm, what to say? You know, when the, when the like, first big review for this book came out, I didn't know if it was a like, positive thing or not, but the guy said, I don't know, I think he, I should be careful what I say since this is recorded. But um, he said something about like how I almost sound like uh, myself um, after Frank O'Hara. This was like also like in the Times, so I thought, well, I wonder if people will like that. And it turns out people did, but I was kind of offended by it. But um, that's okay because I steal all of his titles in this. This is a true account of talking to the moon at Fire Island. His poem is a true account of talking to the sun at Fire Island. So I knew what I was doing, and still I felt a little bitchy about it, you know. The moon woke me up last night, loud and clear, saying, hey, I've been trying to wake you up for 15 minutes. Don't be so rude. You're only the second poet I've ever chosen to speak to personally. Well, I couldn't believe it. It didn't matter anymore that my books have never been nominated for anything or that I've wasted so much time talking to men who don't understand me. This was the moon talking to me, flirting even. The moon was proving every single grant organization wrong, the total of grants I've received in my life being zero. And here it was, my time to shine, literally. I didn't even have to climb a mountain or have an epiphany. I'm not athletic in the least, I said to the moon. I can barely run the reservoir in Central Park, and the only reason I like that is because I can't tell if anyone's emailed me while I'm running. I'm a very gay runner, you see, always checking out dads and listening to Britney on repeat. I like to wear purple and black. I like to feel sexy. What in the actual fuck, said the moon. You need so much help. You need an NEA, a Guggenheim, a National Book Award. No, I said to the moon, I only need you, baby. Or a rich lawyer who will, pay, who will play with my hair and pay for dinners at the Odeon. Seriously, Alex, the moon looked at me in a very stern way. Kind of a bitch, if you ask me. Go to bed immediately. In the morning, I want you to get up and write 300 poems. I want you to keep writing poems no matter what. Don't think about anything else, not even lawyers. Okay, I said, okay, Moon, who knew you were such a top? I was practically shaking. And even though nothing good had happened to me in the last year and I was so sad about my life and my poems, I went to bed feeling loved and appreciated. How many other poets have talked to the Moon? Not even Frank O'Hara. All he got was the sun, and here I was, the center of all beauty, writing these poems. Imagine. I also stole that ending from Frank O'Hara too. It's good to steal from the dead. I mean, what are they gonna do? It's a little uh, cute short poem that I snuck in there. I don't think my editor really wanted this one in there, but it's, it's nice, you know. It's called For the Critics. Um, no, you never got me. No, I don't think that you ever did. When I walk into a bodega and buy cigarettes and ice cream, blueberries and Diet Coke, all so I can cry with real enthusiasm and with feeling, just as soon as I can make it home. That's called performance art. That's performance art, you fucks. Never gotten a review that I actually liked, let me tell you. Um, this poem's called New York, and no one mentioned the cab poem. I love the cab poem, I never read it. 
it's somehow like way too, it's like way too vulnerable. Um, but uh, that poem sort of was inspired by, by the fact that I was taking cabs everywhere. And like I said, I was also broke. And people were like, what are you doing? Um, and so then out of like this sort of working class guilt, I was like, you know, I'm just gonna pull up my iPhone and just pretend that I'm writing. And at first it was really kind of pretending. And then I was like, okay, I'm stuck in traffic again. Okay, I'm late again. I'm always late. So my friends always know this, I'm always late. And um, I just started, you know, writing lines in the cabs. And um, then I started looking back at them and I'm like, you know, these are decent. They, they sound kind of like talking to people. And I became sort of the um, aesthetic parameters of the book that it would sound like I'm meeting someone at a bar, telling them a story, or I'm sort of, you know, in a cab with a friend or walking down the street with a friend and kind of trying to tell them what I'm feeling. Those are weird parameters because they just feel very close to life, right? Um, and a poem is not life, it's still an aesthetic object. So I guess in some ways I was trying to break that with uh, that poem, poem written in a cab, which I won't read, and also this poem called New York. This is a poem sort of chronicling all the places I've cried in in New York, so get ready. It's a lot. New York is the best city to cry in. I've cried on the corner of Spring and Green, smoking one cigarette after another, taking two hour lunch breaks in 2006 at my first internship at Interview Magazine. I cried in Washington Square Park the other night, thinking about healthcare and how I quit my job to write poetry and how even a job in poetry prevents you from writing it. I've cried so many times in front of the fountain at Lincoln Center, then watched the cars drive by on Columbus without reason to cry and I've cried even more then. The one year I lived on St. Mark's Place, I was in grad school and cried at Cafe Orlin with one drink for a million hours until I'd write a poem and immediately send it to the New Yorker, feeling entirely justified because why wouldn't they want it? It was terrible, all of it, but I miss those days most. The six train is my favorite train to cry on. It's always late and full of other people's fathers. No one really looks at you because they're so glad they're not you. And of course, because they know that, the, that being anyone is a tragedy, like the MTA itself. <laughs> yeah, some New Yorkers in the crowd, I'm sure. <laughs> There's something productive about crying in New York. It's almost like crying alone in your apartment, but you can cruise strangers and run errands at the same time. Once I was so exhausted, I started crying in the middle of a drink with my friend Rachel at the Beagle, which is closed now, but I was telling her how people always ask poets to do things for free, as if we don't have to pay rent or attend to our loneliness. I've also cried when I was happy in a cab on the FDR listening to Patti Smith the day my first book got taken and again that night when my parents asked how much money I'd make and what I would do next, you know, after this poetry thing. It turns out that next there's more crying. In so many gay bars I'm going to list them, Boiler Room, Eastern Block, Nowhere, Metropolitan, and I could go on but this poem isn't about gay crying, just crying in general. No identity politics in this poem. Not here. That reminds me how I used to cry and raise pizza, also on St. Mark's Place, and how one time a guy asked if I had cocaine and if we would go somewhere more chill to do it. I was so confused. I pretended to stop crying and said, no, can't you fucking see that I'm crying? Then I went to Cooper Union across the street and continued crying there, but less convincingly. Believe it or not, I've never cried in a man's apartment. A man I was sleeping with or about to, they're all, they've all thought I was too detached and should cry more. They've all been emotionally bankrupt, to say the least, especially the lawyers. Clearly none of them could picture me crying in front of the Bowery Hotel when I lost my wallet the same day I had three poems rejected and went on an awful date, the kind that makes you wonder if you should stop talking to people and just max out your credit card at opening ceremony. Great story. I've also cried in the sunshine on Houston, all of its theaters and the lobby, and each time I remember how someone once told me it was a bathhouse, which is delightful and makes me feel incredibly safe. The sunshine is also closed now, by the way, like opening ceremony, and that's what happens in New York when you finally find a good spot to cry in. It's more or less gone in a flash. Of course, there's been times when I wanted to cry and couldn't, moving, waiting for test results, finding out someone I used to date is now married to a dancer with a nice face and no talent. Good luck with that. I don't think I should count the times I've cried at home. Who could anyway? I've only had three apartments, St. Mark's Place, Houston and Allen, and 75th and 1st. I got that last one being lucky one night on the A train when I ran into a guy who was on the same call sheet for a photo shoot we once did for Out Magazine. He told me he had a friend who had a friend who wanted to pass the apartment down to a friend because the rent was good and in a nice area. I'm that friend, I said, that's me. And I'm still, li still living there, still gay. The last time I cried being two hours ago. Sometimes I cry walking down Prince Street pretending I have allergies. It's my favorite street in the city and my favorite street in the world. 
especially the red brick surrounding the church, where on many weekends in summer, vendors set up their stands and sell mostly odd things. A woman almost sold me a crucifix there in 2010, but I couldn't afford it, so we talked about past lives and Stevie Nicks and how Tusk is certainly better than rumors. By the end of our talk, she just gave it to me. She was a painter and had great energy, and I'm sorry, I know this isn't LA, but that word just does something for me. It might be like counting the wars America's been in if I had to tell you all the restaurants I've cried in. Most of them are in the East Village, but I do love throwing a tantrum on the West Side where people are slightly more scandalized because they're maybe a million dollars richer. I have no idea. I have $574 in my bank account right now, which I did at the time. I've also cried in front of delivery people, and I never feel bad because there's so many reasons to cry here. I know that they get it. Besides, I tip 30%, sometimes 35 if I'm feeling emotional. And I like to take the time to remind people to tip well. It says everything about you, especially on a date. Naturally, when I see someone crying in New York, it's like an invitation, like I should get to work and join them, like we're about to do something important together. I do feel lucky I live here since growing up, I wasn't allowed to cry. And if I have kids, I'll definitely tell them how useful it is and how it costs only nothing. You're free to cry all the time. Please cry, everybody. Please use your freedom until one day you realize you're not free at all. You never were to begin with. You're just another person crying on 10th Street. Again. Anyone cried in New York? Show of hands, yeah? Yeah, all right. Feels good, right? Sometimes. Like everything, sometimes. Where was I? This is a long poem. Thank you for making it through. Three more. Okay, we're gonna get a little bit dark. I was like, am I gonna throw a curveball in? I think I will. Keep it in New York though. Places I've contemplated suicide or sent nudes from. My bed. The bathrooms at the Frederick Hotel. Cabs. The 7-Eleven on 74th and 1st. The Museum of Modern Art the Museum of Modern Arts Robert Gober opening in 2014, my writing desk, the stairwells of so many buildings, an elevator once, my favorite wine bar, which I won't actually name, a few times at a friend's place, a friend I used to sleep with, a friend who used to be a friend, Central Park, the Marlton Hotel, the Plaza, the Starbucks on 75th and 1st, my bathtub, my bathroom, my very sad kitchen, in which I never cook, and look how this is no longer a list poem. I wonder if anyone can tell what I am. I wonder why it is they keep looking. I wonder why they keep looking and asking me to disappear at the same time. Everyone's alone on Mars tonight, and love, sex, death have left for Earth. Part of me is still on a beach where I lost something years ago part of me on a beach in life's playing from the beginning. Nine hawks dividing the dusk, wild light through each tunnel in time. The day I met you never ended for me. Uh, I'm a control freak, uh, I know it's hard to tell, or maybe you can tell, but uh, so, uh, it's probably one of the reasons why we write poems, some of us. It's kind of a false sense of control like everything else. But, um, you know, uh, when I was writing this book, uh, I, you know, I sort of was thinking about, uh, well, I was happy, like I said, but then at the end of it, COVID happened or like right before. And I was like, hmm. So we were in the editing stages of this. And I thought, um, I would love to just tell people what to do one last time. So then I wrote this poem, Notes for My Funeral. This is the last one. Thank you for coming. No one's allowed to tell their sad story at my funeral. No one's allowed to tell my sad story at my funeral. There must be cocaine. Talk shit about all the people I hated. I'll still hate them. Probably even more when I'm dead. Play Lou Reed's perfect day on repeat. Don't cry. Don't be embarrassing. It's not a good song to do drugs to, so after, play Fleetwood and take a Xanax. Rent a room overlooking Central Park and get more drugs. Invite strangers up. Don't return desperate texts from people who hound you because they're boring. Just think about me. Think of New York. How the people who never liked me never liked me because they always assumed I was having too much fun. And you know what? I was. I loved being alive. Thank you.
Thank you, Alex. That was remarkable. Um, yeah, this room was buzzing. Um, and thank you all for coming and joining us today. Uh, it's really good to be back here. Uh, and we hope we'll see you again next month, October 3rd, for Jake Skeets. Um, a couple notes of thanks and uh, an injunction. There should be a sign-up sheet for our email list uh, over by the desk there. So if you're compelled, put your email down. Um, Alex's reading, as all the readings before, are up on will be up on YouTube shortly, uh, where you can just find us on Lunch Pumps. Um, our sponsors and patrons make this all possible. Uh, first of all, the library. Thank you, Amber, as the living representative. But this space uh, is a great gift, and all the resources behind it. Um, also, the Arts Research Center, whom we're partnering with this year. Um, buy books when you get home. Uh, and if you're in a little red chair, maybe you could fold it up and take it to the exit as you're leaving. That would be helpful, I think. Thank you.